Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Hey, another day and another reality to be shattered, Farusha. Yes, indeed, Kate. Mm-hmm. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. How have you been? I've been I've been okay, but mm-hmm. I I actually did have a very strange experience this morning that mm-hmm. involves our uh, next guest, um, and I want to um, just slate before we start. Today okay. is February twenty eighth, twenty seventeen, mm-hmm. and I'm here to say that we have a marvelously interesting guest. Today, we have Mr. Tom Butler, who is an expert on electronic voice production, also known as EVP. He has um, two websites, one of which is atransc.org. The other is ethericstudies.org. He also has um, a book called Your Immortal Self, Exploring the Mindful Way. And this book is almost like three books in one. It is a very, it is a very compelling book. It has loads of information in it, um, not only about electronic voice production, but other things. He and his wife, Lisa, are uh, the people in charge of a group called A-Trans-C, which is a publicly funded group that uh, involves electronic voice production. And uh, let's say hello to Tom, and he'll tell us more about it. That sounds like a great hey, idea. Tom. Hello. So um, what we wanted to start off with, with was maybe for you to uh, explain to us a little bit about these acronyms. Some of our listeners actually have met you. And they have a, right. a, one of them has a question for you. Other of our listeners, I don't know all of our listeners. We do have, you know, somewhat worldwide um, listenership, uh, certainly in the UK, etc. Uh, but not everybody is an expert on electronic voice production, not uh, or contraire. Uh, so it's necessary for you to explain some of these acronyms, if you don't mind. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start out with the uh, the first one. Uh, our association was started by a lady named Sarah Eastep in 1982, and it was put together to help people who were working with what were really uh, voices that shouldn't be on the recordings they were making. They, they would get in a very, very quiet room and uh, sometimes even put their... Um, a recorder and a microwave oven to shield it from mm. radio waves. And mm. they were still getting these voices, and they, they came to realize by the content of some of the words that there were often voices of people that are on the other side now, loved ones. Mm. Uh, were, it was common that somebody would say, uh, like a, a good example, I think, is uh, uh, Martha Copeland's daughter, Kathy, uh transitioned very young and uh she started receiving when she recorded voices or recorded with her audio recorder kathy's voice would show up in the recording sometimes and we have one that I, i'm really proud of that she made where her kathy's dog martha inherited kathy's dog when kathy made her transition and the dog was home alone tearing things up, uh, Martha was of the habit of leaving a, a voice-activated recorder on because she always wanted to hear from her daughter. And you get it. Uh, in the recording, it says, Doja, no, in oh, Kathy's voice. Really? She's scolding her dog that's in the oh. process of tearing up the house. Oh, that's amazing. So that's kind of the nature of the voices. And, the, and, I, and, and you're saying, protection, I, I only have to make... One minor correction: it's, it's electronic voice phenomena. Okay. Um, and and the, so that's the EVP, and the instrumental transcommunication is a voice or is an acronym or a term coined to describe both voice and visual examples of this contact from the other side. And the other one, instrumental transcommunication, is ITC. Yes. 
what would the visual communications that would show up like on a uh, a TV, a, a TV or something of that nature? Yeah, more often uh, some of the some of the early material and uh, some that Lisa and I have recorded is you you develop a video loop. The idea is that you you create a lot of vi- video frequency noise, and the faces form in that noise, huh. just like voices form in the audio frequency noise. Huh. And um, in, in some cases, it's been people we've called on. Uh, I have a, a, a fair likeness of my father. There was one person that came through. You can also create this audio or visual noise rather by rapidly moving water that has light reflected from it. Okay. And that hmm. the, the that chaos... Uh, the, the whole idea seems like a common across all these phenomena is that it looks like the in, impression of our intention causes more order to show up in a chaotic environment. Hmm. So basically these faces are what I call transformed or the voices are transformed out of the noise. A couple of shows ago, one of our listeners, a gentleman named Peter, sometimes at the end of the show, not today, but sometimes at the end of the show, we have something which is like listener's corner, where some of our listeners will contact us about an experience that they have had. And listener Peter, a couple of shows ago, uh, came on, and he was telling us about being out at the hotel in California, famous hotel. Do you remember the name of it, Kate? Uh, Coronado, I or, think. Maybe so. Yeah. But it's oh, down, down in San Diego, yes. Down in Southern California, and he was there with his son, his young son, who was like a teenager at the time. The fellow's grown up now, is probably around 30. But at the time, he was a teenager, and he stopped in there uh, on his way to San Diego with his son. And um, during the middle of the night, Peter saw a, um, the TV seemed to come on, and a woman was asking for help. And apparently, uh, she may have been one of the people who uh, was killed in that hotel in, in times past because the uh, the people at the front desk were not that surprised by the fact that Peter had had an experience. But his experience was rather lengthy with this woman on the TV box, and he had pulled out the um, pulled out the uh, uh, connection to the wall and everything. But she didn't go away until. Until the sun came up, I, I believe that's what he told us in any case. But that that's, would be a more of an ITC type of thing, I take it. Yeah, the, the visual form of ITC. Uh, the, you know, it, every day I learn of a new way that these phenomena happen. Um, the One of the forms of phenomena that we get pretty frequently is, is what I refer to as face-on, turned-off TV. And... Very often, there's a child in the picture, or in, in the in the room, and it's as if somebody is peering into the room, in a, in relationship to this child, and in some cases, we've identified that it was like a, a, an aunt who has transitioned to the other side, uh, watching her child's first steps, or that the, the little boy's first steps, and again, the television set turned off. And um, not vis- the, the, the face not visible during the event, but when pictures were taken and examined, there's that face. And it it, it follows. It doesn't follow any pattern of other f- kinds of phenomena. It's all by itself. And what you're describing from that hotel sounds like a, an, a, what a, a prolonged version of that. And I can see where that could be very unnerving for a person. Yeah, especially since uh, uh, she was, uh, he was alone with his young son, wasn't a little child, but um, uh, he was, and it was really right before uh, cell phones were prominent with um, photo, photographic capabilities. Right. So he has okay. no photographic evidence, but um, uh, he sounded very credible. And in our listener corner, we never question the listener in a um, critical or disparaging, a disparaging way. way because everybody has their own experiences and it's not uh, our duty to 
make light of them in any way, shape, or form. If we've spoken to our listeners before our show, we will never, ever disparage them um, when they come on in terms of the listener's corner. And uh, one, once in a while, we do ask um, vaguely skeptical questions of our guests, but it's not meant in any way to be um, sort of uh, negative towards them, but just that there are people who have questions that want to know that are not debunking, but perhaps skeptical on some level. I wonder if you could give us a little background, um, and I hope I say this gentleman's name correctly. Uh, I believe that the foremost uh, proponent of EVP early on was Constantin R- Rodive. Radave. Radave, okay. Constantine yeah, I'm probably Radovan. not pronouncing that right either. It's, it's, it's just so another country. Yes, indeed. He's Eastern European. I believe I heard yeah. him speak once in German, but German is not his first tongue either. I think he was, might have been a Latvian. I'm not sure. But in the Germanic uh, uh, area there, yes, he, he was um, uh, one. Actually, Frederick Jurgensen is credited with discovering discovering the, the phenomenon in 1959, accidentally recording voices. Uh, he was recording bird calls, according to the story, nighttime bird calls. And he got on the recording that he listened to later, his mother's voice. And Radovay, uh found out about his work and basically went to him to learn how to uh, record these voices. And, and the two of them studied it. Uh, Radave is credited with giving, bringing EVP to the English-speaking world with uh, the book called Breakthrough, and it, and it all kind of began from there. How did you start to get involved with it, Tom? Lisa did it. Ah, um, okay. I went not too long after we got married. She she picked up a book on um, uh, by Sarah Eastup uh, and started reading about EVP, and, and it took her, she said, about a year before she started recording. The first few messages that she lis- had me listen to, not only did I think that she, I'm an engineer, and, and I, I was just really sure that she was mistaking, and, and I didn't hear anything but noise, but then she finally recorded one that is probably one of the best messages I've ever heard in the sense that a bird had fallen out of the nest by where she worked and then died, and she asked her communicators during a VP session what she should have done. And this angelic voice, it was the first EVP I ever heard, said, release and remember, hmm. a woman's voice. And it's for, it's for th- these messages are usually very short, and for just a few syllables, that is a, a world of information. Indeed. Something for us to remember for all loved ones on the other side. So that's how kind of I got started, um, mostly helping her. And then um, later on, uh, Sarah Eastep, she joined Sarah's group. And then Sarah asked us if we would assume leadership of the group when she could no longer run it. We said yes and took over in 2000. And that's kind of where we began. We uh we we just recently we changed the name from the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena to uh, in, well, it's, um, Association Transcommunication or A Trans C uh, in, in 2010. And we did that because we had people from all around the world as members, and we were studying many forms of transetheric influence, like a transcommunication. Following that definition, mental mediumship is transcommunication. So we were studying all of that, and to to be able to broaden the audience and be more open to other countries, we changed the name to Association Transcommunication. And and unfortunately, or I guess you could look at it as unfortunately, people have different ways of looking at somebody's passing. But um, um, Mrs. Estep died last year. Is that correct? It was a few years ago. I'm not sure. A couple of years ago. Okay. Now, but yeah, it's been a few years. Um, and, and, yeah, we're still in touch with her, her daughter, and we have um, one of her books that you can download for free on the, as a matter of fact, the one that got Lisa started, 
but it's on the website. You want to tell us the name of the book? Because many people um, who are listening may want to do exactly that, so they'll know what to look for on your website. Now, this is the atranc.org website, correct? Or right, it- and it'll be under the uh, the resources. And and, and I'll, I'll admit I haven't looked at the word in her name. It's uh, Voice of Eternity, if I remember correctly. But she had another one as well. Um there's other resources and but I, I find too Tom while you're looking for that that <clears throat> you know a lot of the uh, so-called paranormal phenomena are relatively well known but EVP uh, I, I've actually until uh, Farusha brought it up I really was unfamiliar with it I just uh, n- it sounds fascinating but I just had never really even heard of it well, it's it's on the that that is Voices of Eternity. Voices yeah, her of other eternity. book okay. is uh, Roads to Eternity. But in the parapsychological community, the people that study these phenomena, EVP is kind of really low on the list of things they're going to study. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the, the ITC in general, both forms of the phenomena, is just now beginning to get a little bit more recognition with with them. Prior to the movie White Noise, EVP was really, it was so far out on the fringe of society that not too many people knew about it. Right. It's really, it's incredible. It's just really difficult to say that it makes any kind of sense at all, yet there it is. And um, after the the movie White Noise, uh, the, the producers told us that they wanted to make EVP a household term. Cool. Like crop circles and UFOs. And so based on that, we said, okay, we'll help advertise a book or a movie. We had nothing to do with the movie itself, so don't blame us. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. Hollywoodization, but, uh, so to speak, uh, takes yeah, over. But, but it, it's, since then, you know, every town has a few ghost hunting clubs, and every ghost hunting club has a, uh, uh, a one or two EVP practitioners. Okay. Uh, there's still... Uh, a lot of people working with us privately, you know, individual and small groups. It's it's actually has become pretty much of a, a common term amongst uh, people, the paranormalists in general. And it's little by little. Uh, I was invited to help write a paragraph or a chapter, rather, in a new handbook of metaphysics that came out, a handbook of uh, parapsychological 101, something like that. I forget the name of it. Anyway, the, the parapsychologist uh, asked me to help him write the chapter on EVP, and so there was actually a chapter in there for the first time ever on EVP. So we're making progress. Good, good. Um, now, I know that you have had some difficulties with skeptics or really what I call debunkers, um, and mm-hmm. I feel like the people who are in the scientism crowd, the people that are involved with uh, Wikipedia, who are just debunkers. I, you know, am totally against that. And a lot of our um, guests have had problems with their wiki pages, such as uh, Dr. Russell Targ. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm really not a, a big fan of... Um, Wikipedia, where it comes to anything having to do with metaphysics or the paranormal, because they're the first ones who put uh, a big, uh, heavy stone in your boat, so to speak. And uh, but I do, I just have, I have one question, which isn't skeptical exactly. It's just um, something that. Uh, sort of comes to my mind because of some experiences I have had, uh, specifically one with a particular client. Uh, if you recall, I do work as um, a an intuitive reader. I do yeah. not work specifically as a medium, though I have had certain messages come through me, though not uh, certainly I, I am not a trans medium that has anybody speak through me, and I don't claim to be able to speak to the dead per se. But sometimes I do get messages. And a woman came to me, and she was getting a lot of messages um, from some entity that was claiming to be one or the other person in her life, uh, but then was telling her like 10 or 15 true things and then twisting things. 
Um, and when she came to me, um, a ring that I was wearing started burning on my hand. And it really kind of freaked me out, to be honest with you. And I actually sent her to have a, um, a uh, exorcism uh, by a Buddhist healer. Uh, that I am, I know very well. So um, I am wondering if, and I am a believer that we really do not die; that our consciousness goes on in some form. Do I know exactly what form? No, I can't tell you that. But uh, so I'm not like a, a person, as I'm saying, I'm not a debunker. But how do we tell the difference between what I would call uh, a disincarnate entity, a disembodied? spirit, maybe not a spirit of a person, but nonetheless an entity. How do we tell the difference between an entity like this woman seemed to have besieging her and, um, you know, your, your, dead, uh, your dead grandmother, let's say? The current science, the mainstream psychology and, and increasingly with parapsychology, uh, is beginning to realize that we process information from our environment first unconsciously and then consciously you know after it's been processed it's run through let's call it a uh, a, a way of a way of comparing the information with your world view your memory of what's real and not real and if it doesn't fit with that then you might very well just reject it and never be consciously aware of it um more likely what will happen is that it will match up some way with what you have in your memory, your worldview, and you will become conscious of that information based on your interpretation of it. Okay. And and, and we are beginning to realize that we go through every moment of our life basically doing that. And that's things that we physically see, that's things that... Uh, the working theory in parapsychology is that everything has a, a psi or uh, let's call it a, a psychic signature that it broadcasts out into the world. And we're aware of all of those and we process them and ignore a lot of them. And, and But all of them come to our conscious mind the way we understand them. And so what happens, I, I call it cultural contamination. Uh, a, a good example is that uh, uh, Whiteley Schreiber had a, uh, a cover on, I think it was Communion was his paperback book. Yes, that Communion. Had a, an alien face on it. Before that book came out, it, aliens had a, you know, were all shapes and sizes and colors you can imagine. Very, very, After that varied. book, yeah. now when people have an alien encounter, it very typically matches up pretty closely with that book cover. So right now, when somebody says, well, I, I was abducted by alien, this is what they look like, my first thought is that the experience may very well be real, but the way it's coming to me now, the way the person is remembering it, describing it to me, has probably been changed because of his cultural upbringing. Yes, Yes. Well, well, that's and, actually the way the body experiences pain, too. I mean, there's the initial stimulus that goes into the spinal cord, and the spinal cord then shoots it up to the uh, cerebrum that will or will not reject that. And so you have a three-path way uh, of experiencing pain. Most of the time it's just locally, and it just shoots off, and that's that. But that would be interesting because I'm sure the same pathway exists. I, I think actually you're really onto something that makes perfect sense, what you've been saying. Yes, I agree. Well, where the where the trick is is being able to distinguish between you know I, I okay I, I know an awful lot about paranormal phenomena but I don't know enough about it to say that no that's not real or that you, you you're mistaking about your experience and I don't think anybody does we're still learning it's knowable but we still have a lot to learn and when somebody has uh, uh, let's say they're giving you a mediumship message. It, it, I know from personal experience, because I, I give spirit greetings in uh, spiritual society every Sunday, uh, that um, it's, it's very easy for me to color my message to the person based on how I perceive the person. If they look like they're really tired, 
that I have to resist giving them a tired message. Right. Now, the message that's coming through might very well be a valid message. It's just that by the time I, my unconscious mind gets through with it, it's not so so accurate. So what we talk about is lucidity, meaning that I'm I'm more or less lucidly aware of my inner consciousness. And, and what I, I have a term that I use is hyperlucidity, meaning that I think I'm more or less aware, but I'm not actually. So the, the, one of the measures you can use is what I use for myself is, is it a surprise to me? If, if I'm thinking uh, like a worn out old man in front of me, and instead I'm thinking, wow, he's got something really going on, that's a surprise to me. Right. And so I'll go with that. And same thing, I think that if somebody tells you something, if it sounds like them, then I'll say, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll keep that for future reference. How, how do you feel about the concept that um, we are bombarded with a lot more information than we are actually able to process and that our minds are actually a transceiver of information from the consciousness, which is larger, so that our brains, I mean, are just a transceiver of that information and whittles down what we see so that we can continue to live in a world that might have predators or we have to watch out for not getting hit by a car, et cetera, et cetera. The, the um, emerging theory that is becoming widely accepted in parapsychology is written by James Carpenter. He's, he's both a mainstream psychologist. Uh, I think he's a therapist and he's a, he was president of the parapsychological association for one year, I think. Anyway, he's written a book called first sight theory. Uh, it's a difficult read. There's, if you, if you Google it with his name, you'll find a, um, <clears throat> a, a pretty good, PDF file on it. I've I've got it on uh, my ethericstudies.org. If you search for first sight theory, you can find it in a number of places. And basically, it just says what you just described. It, his his operating thesis is that <clears throat> one everything produces a the word psi psi yes is is the is the placekeeper for psychic energy or psychic influence. So. Everything produces a psi signal, everything. Your, your dead Uncle John, the chair in front of you, everything. Um, and when you express your unconscious, even before it becomes conscious to you, your unconscious expression produces a, a psychokinetic signal or influence. And so that's, that's basically a, a force or influence that you're putting out into the environment. So, for instance, when you think, you know, God, I hate that car, well, you're sending a message out there that is certainly not helpful for your car. No, no, indeed. You know, so, so that's those are the two foundation ideas, and then based on it, he's got thirteen corollaries that talk about. Well, basically, it's a rule set for how we think unconsciously, and one of the things is that we turn toward ideas or we turn away from ideas unconsciously, mm -hmm. depending on our own interest. We, we switch back and forth very rapidly or not so rapidly. And the, the good news is that what I call mindful, mindfulness, not the mindful living they're teaching so much on the Internet, but being aware of the implications of your actions and thoughts, you can actually control how you respond to these unconscious thoughts. So it, 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 you're, you're exactly right on. You're, the way you're going is, is the right thought. It's worth looking up. I've tried to digest it, and, and uh, if I, like I say, search on ethericstudies.org for uh, first sight theory. And I, okay. And, and I've used, I've applied it in there in a lot of different ways that'll help people. But it, it's, to me, it's a very powerful and, and uh, important change to the paranormalist community because it gives you a foundation, a good scientific foundation for why we need to be really careful about our channeling and our mediumship and our, our, 
paranormal experiences because they're all being kind of translated by our unconscious expectations. Yes, yes, I could see where that would definitely be the case. And I know that um, it, within the uh, community of um, near-death experiencers, the, um, the scientific people, parapsychologists versus neuroscientists, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. the parapsychologists often go with the idea which we just kind of spoke about, whereas the neuroscientists, many of them still believe that the brain is the center of the mind and, uh, and consciousness, whereas the parapsychologists are more taking the view that the consciousness is outside of the brain and the, the brain is just relating as a uh, transceiver of the information and sort of sorting the information out. So right. Um, right now with your uh, group, what is exactly, what is going on right now that we should know about, that uh, our community should know about if they wish to interface with your community? Well, we, we stopped publishing a news journal uh, a couple of years ago, and one of the reasons why uh, is that our, where our membership had dwindled a little bit, and Facebook became, you know, mm. websites like Facebook became very popular too for people to uh, socialize, really. And um, so we, we just kind of felt like we were uh, not doing as much good as we were originally, and people have evolved into other areas. Plus, I think Lisa and I. Uh, we were due for a little bit of vacation time, I think. So hey. we, we, we've we cut back. The I have one research project that I'm still uh, trying to put together uh, that's studying the uh, uh, the energy content of uh, EVP signals or sound sound streams. Other than that, I, I produce a uh, uh, an occasional update. Uh, of what's going on, and, and it's there's a, a place on the website for atranc.org to um, register for that, and also uh, we're maintaining the uh, the idea exchange discussion board. Although right now it's kind of a ghost town, but I maintain that primarily for people who want to come in and ask questions and share ideas and everything. So I'm thinking that as people wear out on Facebook, they're going to be coming around to that again. So those are the two areas where, uh, my, myself, I'm I'm in the process of um, starting a, uh, a another book that's focused on transcommunication specifically. It's going to still have some of the social environmental issues involved in it. You can't get away from the way we perceive. You have right. to talk about that. Right. But also, I'm I, I want to get back to. Uh, the uh, video loop uh, ITC and start working on collection of uh, uh, more modern technology brought to that. Now, what would you say to somebody who has had an experience uh, uh, such as uh, an EVP or an ITC? How can they look to preserve it or in some way document it? What would be your basic, not somebody who's going to spend their life doing it, but sure. somebody who has this experience? Well, th this always has, has been an interesting point. Um, the, the electronic voice phenomena examples are, are really quite common um, and, and when you start looking for them. And what we try to teach, first of all, is people how to be able to record these for themselves. Um, but the, the biggest thing, I think, is for people to try you know, the takeaway message on electronic voice phenomena isn't the message so much as the fact that it's there, the existence of it. And I, I think that every, every generation or a few generations has its own spiritual revelation. And, you know, you go back to Egypt and Hermes and you've got Christ and you've got cultural different teachers come in and provide a revelation of what we who we really are and, and our re relationship to the greater reality. Well, I feel like the paranormal phenomena we're all experiencing these days is part of a, a, a new form of revelation and, and, and effect that 
it's teaching us. For instance, a, a physical medium doesn't demonstrate to to give you a G whiz that was fantastic experience. He's teaching you that you continue after this thing called death. That's really the reason why he, he demonstrates. Same thing for mediumship. You don't give a message to somebody to connect them to their loved one because they'll just turn around and go find somebody else and get connected again, and it becomes almost obsessive. What we do is we try to show the continuity of life. That's the revelation. Well, that's wonderful. That is, uh, And I think the NDE people are uh, kind of working on the same principles. Yes. Um, which brings me, you sort of answered one of the questions um, that uh, one of our listeners had, which was that um, you had a June 2006 conference which featured Alan Botkin, uh, the late yeah. Sarah S. Estep, and um, Gary Schwartz, Alec McRae from the Isle of Skye, and some of the Skoll Experiment people. And uh, my friend and, and listener uh, said uh, he had met you there. He was very impressed, but he was surprised that you never had another um, conference. And this may be part of the fact that you decided to take a, a little step backward and, um, and take a vacation, if you will. Is that, is that the case? Because he was very impressed by your work at that conference. That we were impressed too. I mean, the, the people that we were able to attract to that from around the world, really, um, it was it was very much of an international uh, organ or meeting there of, of people. It, it it cost our association money uh, quite a bit actually, and we attempted to have one a couple of years later and actually had to cancel it because of lack of interest. Wow. Um, it. Th- well, there's a couple of things going on. One of them, Lisa and I are probably not the most charismatic people in the world. We're pragmatic, and the majority of people working with these phenomena, it's more hobby level, and it's fun. If it isn't fun, they don't want to do it. Uh, you know, you, there's an old phrase in, in spiritual development is that you've got to do the work. Well, we, our organization kind of built up around the idea that you've got to do the work. Right. And the, <laughs> and that's no fun. So I, I, I and here I, I am in danger of making excuses. I don't know exactly what happened, but it, as time went on, interest moved on to other areas, and uh, we just basically decided that uh, we weren't real successful in, in recruiting board members and other leaders and stuff like that. Uh, I'm in my 70s now. Oh, oh my goodness, uh, okay. And I'm enjoying cruising, mm-hmm. and um, I'm writing books. And we we we've recruited recruited a couple people that disappeared. One of them died, oh. um, and, and we just kind of gave up on. It. So the way it stands right now is that we're we're thinking more in terms of legacy. We, we're trying to preserve. We've got all the newsletters on the website now, um, but it's time for the next generation. Yes. And, I I hear you, and um, it sort of sounds like the UFO conferences where the age group is getting older and older that attends uh, these different UFO conferences, and people want it to be fun rather than putting in the legwork, and also um, the younger generation of people do everything online. But my friend had said that your 2006 conference was very well attended, and he was very pleased with it. So that's a, a little kudo to you at any rate. Yeah, we appreciate that because it, it was a lot of work, but it was also very rewarding for us because of the, the, the speakers and the attendees. Well, I was going to say, too, uh, that it's interesting that you look on the brain as a transceiver. I mean, that would explain the epiphanies that you th- see throughout history, uh, not just socially, but also uh, scientifically, too. Well, it, it does. And there's research basically showing that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, the uh, Watson and Crick waking up, thinking about a snake eating its tail and realizing that that's the RNA or DNA structure. There's just so many examples. Tesla used to go in these deep states and then come out and figure out how alternating current existed. Uh, it's almost as if the information exists out there 
And um, I've always had that feeling that that's, you know, animals know how to do things. They know how to build a nest, and we don't. And uh, that information's out there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, just a ra- radio, com- it comes to me that radio was sort of uh, simultaneously developed in various different places yeah. in the world, not only by Marconi, but other people were developing it at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it was an idea whose time had come, and somehow uh, that information was put out on the uh, the psychic network, <laughs> so to speak. So, 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 Once again, look up Rupert Sheldrick. Yes. On my on etheric he has a theory. Uh, actually, actually, I'm I'm barred for life from working on his website, his uh, <laughs> Wikipedia article. Oh. Uh, it's it's interesting because the the, uh, the skeptics just hate his work. He's but a wonderful it, man. My opinion, the hypothesis fabulous. Of formative causation basically gives you a model for why those birds know how to do that mm-hmm. and why simultaneous. Uh, discoveries occur. It, it's it's one of the formative influences on the writing of my book. So, so as an electronics engineer, it would be interesting for you to figure out what the frequency of that transmission is, because you could pick up knowing the frequency just lots of information. And I think that's that's where you were sort of headed. Well, we, we spend a lot of time looking for frequencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we, literally, we've we've tried. We've looked under just about every rock you can imagine. Just dialed um, up and down. <laughs> yeah, and, uh-huh. and, and basically the answer is that the, one of my goals as an engineer, you know, you're always looking for the 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 mechanics. I'm, I live in a very actionable uh, philosophy world, and the etheric physical interface. What in the heck is that? You know, how does this thought turn into a signal that ends up on your recorder? Well. The, the etheric is conceptual, and the physical is conceptual assigned as physical. That's the, you know, if we're creating our own reality, basically what it boils down to is that we, as a collective understanding, have decided that when we have an experience that's that is supposed to be physical, then we assign physicality to what becomes part of our consciousness. Mm-hmm. So. In a, in a matter of speaking, that electronic voice phenomena is a, a concept that's been uh, brought into the physical, and the, the actual physical mechanism for it appears to be a, a form of stochastic amplification. Basically, that's a very broad-spectrum, large signal, uh, audio signal or optical signal, will amplify a weak signal so that it becomes visible or optical or audio that interface has nothing to do with electromagnetic, electricity, uh, frequency, anything. It's 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 basically a, a conceptual influence on a physical process. And the closest I can come to that is in the brain, we don't see a near, neuron fire for recognition of a color. We see a field of neurons firing and what they're doing is they're producing a broad spectrum energetic field very much like the noise in our evp or the visible noise in our uh, itc visual itc so the the same physical processes we're seeing here there everywhere associated with these phenomena and again the it's very dangerous uh intellectually to try to explain these phenomena based on physical principles. Because basically what we see is a manifestation. You just don't see the energy behind it. There has to be an yep. energy field somewhere. There has to be. If we uh, Influence. Think, think influence instead of energy. There's an well, influence field. But that, that, that still has to be it. Um, some sort of an... You know, when you say energy, I'm not necessarily talking about electricity or whatever, but there has to be some sort of... A, I don't know, for want of a better word, maybe a spiritual energy type thing. But there has to be something. There ha- I, I, I mean, really, okay. I mean, you just don't get something from nothing. We already, I, I understand uh, what you're saying. Uh, but it, the, the, reason I, what, the reason I make a point about that uh-huh. is because if, if you can start thinking in terms of the perspective of your uh, 
uh, your, your etheric self rather than your physical self, then that starts to open up the channel of communication between those two. Mm. And and if you if you still think you know like electromagnetic energy is is a very physical self explanation where in the etheric world electromagnetic electromagnetic energy is a product of influence okay so and it's it, these are abstractions and i apologize for that sure. but I, the only way i can find to help people start thinking as as not from the inside of their head but from the outside of their head you know, actually, it's uh, it's too bad that you gave up on your studies because I think you were really onto something. And as you said, that revelations come as generations come, and I think you may have been the uh, forerunners there. Well, I I really think that one way to look at it, the way I look at it, in any case of what Kate was talking about to you and you were answering her, is I I kind of look at it in terms of uh, quantum physics, the way quantum physicists look at it. In, in that um, we're not really matter. The matter isn't really Well, you're going real. into virtual particles and stuff, yeah. which is just what he was saying. Yeah. But um, that, I, I verbalize it a little differently, but I think we're coming from the same place. Uh, what do you think, Tom? An, an interesting exercise is one of the chapters in, in the book, uh, I have uh, the Mandelbrot set. Are you familiar with chaos yeah. theory? Yes, sure. yes. Okay, fractal geometry that... The, the the Mandelbrot set is an interesting model for what the greater reality might look like. It, it, it you have all of this fantastic universe you can fly through mathematically you know, by changing changing the formulas because it's calculated a point at a time. So what you do is you change the beginning point and you're in another part of it. And the the, the faster that the calculation goes to infinity determines the color that you assign to where you're anyway the the whole thing is is an infinitely large mathematical universe is in an area that is only numerically it's what's an imaginary space it's numerically between one and two an imaginary number one and two so if you think of that the creation of our world is such a very simple idea can create such complexity that uh, then can take on a, a reality of its own. And if you're that point wandering around in there with different assumptions, it, 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 it all gets to be the point where it's just an imaginary exercise. What I've, what I've come to say is that the, the most important uh, formative principle we've got is uh, perceptual agreement. If you're not perceptually in agreement with an aspect of reality, then you won't experience it. Mm, that's good. But, but that's one of the major arguments against creationism, where they say, oh, the world is so complex that it couldn't possibly have just come into existence on its own. Someone would have had to create it. But, you know, uh, mathem mathematics such as the Mandelbrot set would explain it. Which also, it's always, always so annoying to me that they finally found a star with seven planets. And I mean, how could they not have expected to find something like that? Uh, it, it's just such, you're right, the, the whole universe is such a fractal patterning. I mean, the, of course the planets had to be there. And you know that there's going to be life there. So, yeah, somewhere. I sure hope there's life there. Oh, there's you know that there's, I mean, who knows what form, but there's definitely some sort. Well, like you were just saying, that there's a a, a force of some nature uh, that manifests itself in different ways, and maybe it's not an actual energetic force, but it is something out there that is will create manifestations, and it's throughout the universe, so of course you're going to see life forms. Yeah, and, and what's interesting with within the model that I use for I, I describe it ourselves our relationship between ourselves and our physical body as an avatar relationship. Oh. Excuse me. And the model doesn't restrict you to people to, to human beings. There's nothing to say that your your cat isn't in an avatar relationship with. A, uh, a non-physical personality as well. Hmm. And 
there's a universality that you know really the co- the most common denominator of all reality is a combination of life field and intention hmm. some of this sounds a little bit like uh, one of our previous guests tom campbell who wrote my big toe theory of everything are you familiar with his work yeah i am I, uh the after, after examining four or five toes, if you will, <laughs> theories of everything, um, I, I finally got to the point where uh, I'm just going to trust them. They, okay. they know what they're talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, just to finish out here, we have one other question uh, from somebody who knew that you were coming on and who is our listener. And uh, this question wanted to know if... Forever Families still exists uh, with uh, Dr. Julie Beischel and uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz, and if you had anything to do with them over the course of your uh, experiences. Well, we've we've spoken at a number of their conferences, and um, uh, in the past have been very supportive of them. The, they're they're alive and well. They're they're uh, the uh, Guggenheim's. Nah, I've got the wrong. The, the wrong people there, uh, Fran and, and uh, Bill, yeah, Guggenheim, that's right. They work as hard as anybody to bring these phenomena to the public and to help people understand what their experiences are. Their focus is mostly on mediumship. They do an excellent job of uh, testing mediums and trying to make sure that they're safe to be re- uh, referred for yes. other people. Um I think that uh, Gary and Ju- Julie's still involved with them. I'm not sure where Gary is these days, but uh, they're still very much alive and well. Yes, the Forever Families group is what you're speaking about, right? Because I've I've met yeah. I've met uh, the good Dr. Julie uh, at an SSE conference, and she's a very a very interesting. She and her husband are very very interesting, and uh, their Winbridge Institute is uh, a fascinating concept. Uh, I don't know Mr. Schwartz, Dr. Schwartz, but um, I, I have met uh, Dr. Beischel, and I just uh, had this question. I don't know anything about forever families except that they give support to the parents of children who died. Is that that would be the general? Uh... That, that's their their purpose. They they had uh, lost lost a child too early, mm-hmm. and um, as the story goes, they went to. Uh, uh, meetings for grief recovery and everything, and, and talking about communication with a, a dead loved one wasn't allowed in the meeting, so that they were finding themselves out in the parking lot talking about it, and decided it was time to start an organization dedicated to that. You know, Tom, earlier you said that uh, you have to do the work. If uh, one of our listeners gets interested in this field and would like to do that, how do they start? I mean, it's certainly... I don't think there's any courses in the colleges right now. Well, I guess a few, but I mean, how would you start investigating this? Where where does one start? Well, the, one of the things I think is important uh, is, is to realize the, uh, the 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 who the major players are in the sense that uh, uh, the majority of parapsychologists are actually mainstream uh, psychologists that are. are uh, animalistic psychology, I never pronounced that word correctly, but the the psychology of anomalous experiences, um, it's basically dedicated to showing that these paranormal phenomena are actually ordinary things mistaking as paranormal, so they're basically debunkers, but they're also probably a a majority of the uh, parapsychologists. Uh, the next larger group is uh, the exceptional experiences psychology people, and, and they support the idea of the existence of a psi field. I refer to them as super psi, uh, and, uh, and they they accept a greater reality in the sense that when you die, the memory, your memory remains in the ethers forever and is somehow hmm. accessible by other people. That is a, um, uh, it, it, in, and from my perspective as a survival person, that's an anti-survival position. And then a very, very small minority of the parapsychologists are actually 
think that survival is real and, and are working to, to understand it. And Julie, for instance, is one of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, I think that uh, when a person studies these, you know, they can take a, a course in psychology in a university and probably get talked out of thinking that these phenomena are real. So you really have to be careful about that. In terms of learning how to work with the phenomena, one of the places I would go is, is uh, first of all, both, both atranc.org and etheric studies.org. Etheric studies is my personal website, and I feel free to be a little bit more outlandish in it than I can be. Okay. <laughs> so, and in that, there's there, there's a, a lot of information that I think I, I try to offer references. So there's a lot of good study guides okay. there. Um, the ATRANC, there's a, a white paper. If they Google, or not Google, if they, if they search on the website for a white paper, they'll find uh, a really good rundown on how to, what, what the, both forms of ITCR and how to work with them. So that would, that, that's kind of where I'd start. Okay. Well, We're that, always happy to answer questions. There's a contact form. So again, I guess we should give the website and, and the book. But uh, that's so. You're uh, if someone is interested and they contact you via the website, you're happy to uh, speak to them or or yeah, at least communicate with them. Okay, yes. that's nice to know. Well, we will give uh, the the book and the website at the end. We have mm-hmm. we're coming toward a close. We're not quite finished yet. Okay, um, and. Uh, I guess I wanted to uh, sort of ask you a little bit about uh, my experience this morning and my one and only experience with EVP. I have okay. lots and lots of uh, psychic experiences of various sorts, but about a month after uh, 9-11, uh, I have an apartment in Manhattan, and I was in that apartment, and I still had one of the older-fashioned um answering machines, which basically most people don't have anymore, but that was um, 16 years ago, and I had one. And between messages on my on this machine came a voice, a man's voice that I didn't recognize, and it said, get out, like that. And it was sort okay. of a little bit frightening. And that was my only experience with an actual phenomena that was uh, would have been perceivable to anybody in the room, I would expect, um, that came out of my machine. And so that was my single experience. And, and I wondered if you could speak to that for a second. The, the, those, you know, that, that first of all, the, you know, the characteristics of it all pretty consistent for EVP. Uh, we, we found zero reason to be afraid of EVP. And some of the, the get out ones have been actually pretty humorous, uh, we have one EVP that says, prepare to die, you know, very <laughs> oh gentlemanly. <my. laughs> yeah. Anyway, the, the, there would be two things I would say. One of them is it does sound like an EVP, and two is I would try to remember where your head was at the time. Like if you were thinking about moving out of there, that would be – because we, we feel like you know we're the channel for these messages, we, either ourselves or an entrance – interested observer it's possible for a person at least lisa who doesn't believe in demons doesn't believe in uh she's not afraid of the dark she's very pragmatic she recorded in a room along with a girl that just loved to be afraid Uh-oh. <laughs> uh she she's you know it's hysterical personality they both recorded in, the, in this this area together different recorders and the, the scary girl got get out i hate you go away stuff like that and lisa got useful information about people that live there and stuff. Um, we, we know with a high degree of confidence that the, the message originates for real, but we, again, we transform it with our unconscious mind. We're the channel for the things propagating into the physical. That's the model we're using anyway. And so you're, what I do with that get out, I would also look at possibly some of the, you know, what, what's in your thoughts at the time? I would be a liar if I didn't say that almost everyone that I came in contact with in lower Manhattan within the months directly after 9-11 didn't have thoughts in their mind such as, what am I doing here? Why do oh. I live here? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but okay. I, 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 so I'm sure that your explanation there would ring very true to me. Now, the second thing was that this morning, um, in the early morning hours, I, w- and this is not the first time such a thing has happened to me, but I, I sometimes hear voices, okay? And I mm-hmm. kind of characterize those voices differently. And this is just, it's not meant to be, when I say this, I'm not teaching. So it's just what I do. Uh, if sure. if the voice seems to com- come from within my head, like in my brain, in my mind, whatever you want to say, I characterize that as possibly coming from my higher self. Whereas if the voice seems to come from outside my head, I characterize that as perhaps being a message from um, another another entity um, on some level. So uh, this morning, I was uh, laying in bed. It was the wee hours of the morning. And in my right ear, I heard uh, the sound of a harpsichord, only one or two notes. And mm-hmm. I was like, I sat up in bed. I mean, I was kind of in a liminal state, but uh, I wasn't asleep. And I sat up in bed and I sleep with two pillows and I looked under the pillows and there was nothing there to make a noise. And so I said, wow, that's weird. Put my head back down again and very shortly thereafter, again, and this time it was clearly two different notes that were hit. And I sat up again, looked again, and I thought to myself, could it be an insect in my pillow? But in fact, other times I've heard buzzers and stuff like that. So I laid back down again, and I would say five to ten minutes later, darned if it didn't happen again. And this time it was like... um, the kind of almost electronic bell that's inside a child's ball that has a very sweet sound to it. You might give such a ball to a a, a toddler or a, a, someone around that age. And um, I, after that, I, I was no point in trying to sleep anymore <laughs> because, <laughs> and I thought, how interesting, since we're going to be speaking to Tom Butler later, and he is very much involved in these different sorts of voices. So I just wanted to pass that on to you. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being on. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. I, I don't blame you if you don't. It's just kind of a personal experience. But uh, well, I, I, w- I would say one thing. One of things is that you assigned the, the meaning of, or the source of, of voices you hear by by where you perceive them to coming from. Yes. That's actually a pretty pretty good way of being it because, it, 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 again, you're, you're instructing your unconscious mind that this is the way I want to hear this and this is the way I want to hear that. So um, that's pretty valid. And there is, you know, of course, you look at, at the the, uh, the, the, the tr- tradition of direct voices in the air, and, and it's one of the ways that physical media will manifest a voice and often that voice will be of a known discarnate personality and with some very often very good information. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that, that that subliminal state, that hypergogy, I think I'm saying it right, that, that, that state between sleep and awake, uh, some really interesting lucid experiences can occur. They sure do. But also... <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you know radio stations in the air and stuff like that. So our our brains are very good at filling vacuums with whatever comes to mind. But it sounds like you know that that kind of bell might not have any meaning, but it certainly uh, is the kind of thing that would trigger your thinking to pay more attention. Monroe uses something like that for okay, wake up, listen up. You know this is going on now. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I have frequented the Monroe Institute, and uh, so um, that's a really wonderful place to, to visit. But before we say goodbye, could you possibly uh, recite to us your, the name of your book and your websites for our listening audience? Okay, well, the, the, the main website is the Association of Trans Communication. It's A Trans C A T R. A N S C at dot uh, org dot org, and that's that's got a uh, contact page that is accessible from every page, and also uh, I have linked to that a uh, 
idea exchange discussion forum that people are welcome to join. And then ethericstudies.org is my own personal pages, and it also has contact information on it. Um, the, the book itself is Your Immortal Self, Exploring the Mindful Way. And it's got primarily, it's the theory that I've talked about some here, trying to uh, give you a model. One of the things that they used to almost every day beat me up about when I was a Wikipedia editor, the skeptic could say, well, you guys don't have even a theory to explain this. So this book is, is my attempt to provide that theory. And then the, the three t- phases of a teacher, one of the phases is how you live. So the, the environment in which we, we work with paranormal phenomena is the second section, and the last section is how the theory applies to uh, the various forms of phenomena, specifically EVP and IDC, but also uh, healing intentions, stuff like that. So the book is is what I have tried to do a – if I'm not here and I want people to, to learn things that I've been trying to teach them all my life, mm-hmm. they're in that book. It's a wonderful book, and um, we barely scratched the surface with it. It is It, it has so much information that it would take – many, many podcast timeframes to really d- delve into all the wonderful information you have in there. And, and, and Tom Butler, I want to thank you very much for being on. We send our best regards to Lisa, and go ahead. Yeah, No, I was just saying that the book itself proves your theory. You, you, you had this information, it manifested as a book, and bingo, that's it. That's true. I, it is. Congratulations. Got to do the work. <laughs> be, be, beyond that, I would say to those folks at Wikipedia, because one doesn't have an explanation for a phenomena, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And, and as we say in the Bronx, <laughs> <laughs> Bronx here, we're a little bit, uh, we're a little bit irreverent here at Shattered Reality, Tom. <laughs> okay. Well, it all comes down with you know the, your skeptics are basically. The, it, you're dealing with a situation of where it's probably scientism is a religion. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, and, yes. And so that's beyond any reasoning. Yeah. A little healthy skepticism is good, but debunking definitely stinks. That's my opinion. Yeah. They, they stole the, the the term skeptic or skepticism, so I say a little bit of healthy uh, discernment will yes. go a long yes. way. Yes, yes. Okay. I agree. So once again, thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Great discussion. Uh, it's a thank field you. that I really had absolutely no knowledge of before, but now um, I am, as they say, in the spiritual world, enlightened. And I thank you for that. Okay. So At your service. <laughs> take care now, Tom. We hope to have you back sometime. Bye okay. now. Bye. Well, that was a really... Um, that was a really interesting conversation with Tom Butler, and he really is a fount of knowledge. What was that? Did you hear that noise? Yeah. That is so funny. I, honestly, listeners or people out there, that was not staged. No, it wasn't. I wonder, Did you hear the cat, I, too, when he was speaking? I heard something just now very, very Oh, clearly. just now was, eh. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if it recorded. I wonder if it did too. We'll have to wait so. until Ooh. we uh, we oh. work out our website, uh, our podcast here, and see if it recorded on on. Well, the physical manifestation is the goosebumps I just got. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There was definitely Ooh. a very strange, strange sound there, and. Um, well, uh, from Shattered Reality, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm Farusha. Yeah, and I am Kate Valentine. And we hope to hear from you, listeners out there, if you have uh, experiences for our yeah, listeners' Yeah, please, corner. please, you know, g- g- give us a buzz. Let us know. It's on the website. Yeah, we have a, no. a various ways to contact us. Please do so, and we will be happy uh, uh, to very put happy. You on. Yeah, yeah, more than happy. In our listeners' corner. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. That was weird. Well, okay. On another weird um, recording of Shattered Reality, we are here to say adieu, goodbye. Goodbye from uh, Shattered, Shattered Reality. reality.
what was that 